and this is Gleason and Barbara. 95-year-old Shirley Batchelder never forgets a friend. This is Nancy. Shirley always takes a picture when someone new visits her Sunday school class at Christ United Methodist Church near Nashville, Tennessee. They're kind of like your flashcards, aren't they, Shirley? Uh, they, they, they are, yeah. And she never misses a chance to make a new friend. Like the time Shirley took in a homeless man her daughter brought home from the park. When I got to the back room with the couch and it, the Lord tapped me on the shoulder and said, have him sleep there. So uh, Imad was with me for two years. He would, I have been praying for an angel and he certainly was. Prayer is an important part of each day. Shirley's signature flower headbands are a gratitude tradition she started way back on her 80th birthday. I was kind of nostalgic and thinking about all the wonderful things that God had given me, the three beautiful children, the wonderful husband, the nice house, the garden, two wonderful cats, and you know, all my friends and all the church, and I thought, I should do something. And I said, I will put flowers in my hair, and in the morning when I put them on, I will say thank you, Lord, for all the good things that you have supplied me with. Thank you. Shirley is a bit of a local celebrity around town for convincing an ad agency to put up billboards for free, reminding people to love one another. It was something God asked her to do. I said to him, you know, Lord, that, that's going to cost a bundle. He said, well, if you have to mortgage your house, I wish you would do it. My granddaughter photographed me. When Lamar saw it, they said, we will put 21 billboards up. And so it was quite an exciting moment for me. Shirley says helping God to spread messages is the least she can do. Sure, I haven't had a life of ease by any means. I've had a lot of operations and uh, miscarriages and uh, family upsets and all kinds of things. But there's always been the Lord that's taken care of me. What would you say to somebody who feels like they're lost? They're lost? Yeah. Oh, I would, I would love to meet that person because I would say, you know, you're one of the lambs that are lost and somebody's looking for you. And I know who's looking for you. It's the Lord. Shirley says one of the greatest gifts in these 95 years has been the friends God sent to walk with her every single day. The more we love, the more we find that life is good and friends are kind. For only what we give away enriches us from day to day. This video was brought to you by the people of the United Methodist Church through world service donations. Well, if you couldn't recognize that was Claire, who was who was ringing the bell for us this morning, Claire has has rung the bell for for years. And when I asked if she would do that, uh, she did it without hesitation. So um, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, she's been ringing that at the Yellow Springs Church of Gosh for I don't know how long, six years, quite some time. Anyway, hello, friends. This week, we will be talking about, um, about questions. When we question Jesus and wonder really what the answer should be. And, and I want to tell you, don't worry, because Jesus always will have an answer for us. And Jesus, 
uh, also in this um, this gospel lesson, he might even share uh, also what it means to be a servant. Now, I'm also, I'm here at the front part of the sanctuary at Yellow Springs. I'll be preaching from uh, Fairborn United Methodist today too. But I wanted to uh, begin with some questions, not my questions, but I wanted to share some of the questions that children have um, and questions that they have about God because they have many questions. They ask questions like, why did God make mosquitoes? Because all they do is bite. So they want to know, God, why did you do that? They even ask, why does God stay in heaven and not come down to earth to visit all the time? One person even asked, did Jesus get potty trained as fast as me? Good question. And here's another question. How did Jesus even rise from the grave? Did he, did he punch out his grave and say, this isn't the last of Jesus? I mean, I don't know. But there's a child who's questioning that. Did Jesus practice walking on water first? How can I do it? Now, I'll tell you, when I was young, I wondered about that. And then here's another one. Here's another one that uh, someone has, has questioned. And quite frankly, this is one that when I was young, I pondered as well. If Jesus doesn't have a sister, then why do I have to have one? Shirley, if you're listening today, I'm sorry. Okay? So, there's always questions. We should always question um, things. But if we do, present them to God. God's always listening. Now, next Sunday is the first Sunday of October and is always traditionally World Communion Sunday. So, be prepared with your communion elements. Also, um, at the beginning of next week's little chat that I do like this, we'll be sharing some of the photos we received um, of what many of you presented as your communion at home during our last communion time. And I must say that um, you folks um, shared communion in many different ways. And they were all very special to you. So we would like to present those as a means of sharing uh, just how people were able to experience communion at home. Now, as we begin our time of worship, I would like to begin with a prayer from St. Francis that many of you know but I think it's one that's uh, maybe a good starter for all of us for today. So let's pray together. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light, and where there is sadness, joy. O oh, Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, and it's in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it's in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Friends, let's worship together. Good morning. I'm Gary Blevins from the Yellow Springs Church. Our scripture reading today is from Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 through 32. For some context, 
On the day before our scripture reading, Jesus had entered the temple and found a marketplace of vendors and buyers. He drove out all who were selling and buying, overturned tables of the money changers and benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. And verse 23, which begins the following day. Jesus entered the temple, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and elders of the people came to him and said, By what authority are you doing these things? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or from men? They discussed it amongst themselves and said, If we say from heaven, then he will ask, Why didn't you believe him? If we say from men, we are afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered, We don't know. Then Jesus said, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Jesus tells the parable of the two sons. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered, but later changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of his sons did what the father wanted? The first they answered, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. The word of God for the people of God. Good morning, church. My name is Steve Holmes. I'm from the Fairborn United Methodist Church, and I have been asked to give the morning prayer this morning. Our scripture reading today is from Matthew 21, beginning in verse 23 through 33. And this is where Jesus' authority is questioned, and he turns it around and questions them. So I hope you'll all go out and read this for yourselves. At this time, would you please pray with me? O oh God of hope, you have brought us through another week of uncertainties by your mercies and grace. Our lives may change, but you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We praise you that you have been with us every moment of each day. Your goodness has opened your hands to supply us with all that is needed. You have forgiven our sins, strengthened our faith, and nurtured our hope. We pray you will help us be mindful of your mighty acts and see the wonder and beauty of your creation as seasons change. You are good to all, and your compassion is over all that you have made. Blessed be your holy name forever and ever, for you are great and greatly to be praised. O God of hope, we confess that at times we find ourselves doing what we do not want to do, and sometimes not doing what we know we should do. Have mercy upon us, and keep us humble, trusting in your grace. Help us to be led by your Spirit, and not by our selfish desires. O God of hope, we thank you for the hope that we, we have in you that is eternal. We thank you for your loving care and undeserved mercies. 
We thank you, O God, for the saving faith in Jesus. Give us a deep abiding faith. Help us to show others our faith by our, by our actions. May others know that we are Christians by our love. O God of hope, in your tender mercies, may you heal the sick, relieve suffering, strengthen the weak, curb the wicked, Help the troubled and comfort the sorrowing. We pray, O Lord, for a government which rules for the welfare of all. Please protect our country, our churches, our homes, and our schools. Bring healing and peace to our land. <coughs> Excuse me. May there be a spiritual revival within our country, putting you first and walking in your ways. O God of hope, open our eyes to every opportunity to do good. Give us faithfulness for every task set before us, and grant us grace to serve all people in your name. Wherein, when an encouraging word is needed, let us give it. Whenever a helping hand is needed to lift a burden, make our hands ready. Now, O God of hope, fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in you, so that we may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God of hope, we join together in praying the prayer your Son taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Have a wonderful day, church. Hi, my name is Cindy and I am the Children's Director at Fairborn United Methodist and today I'm going to share with you a story about one of my favorite Old Testament characters. His name is Joseph and we find his story in the book of Genesis. This is Joseph. Joseph comes from a large family. He has 12 brothers. Of all his siblings, Joseph is his father's favorite. One day, Joseph's father gives him a coat made from many colors. He had never given any of Joseph's brothers anything so beautiful. Joseph's brothers were very jealous. Joseph's brothers were so jealous that they threw Joseph in a pit, tore up his coat, and lied to their father, telling him that Joseph had died. Joseph, Joseph's brothers then sold Joseph to some traveling merchants headed for faraway lands. When the merchants arrived in Egypt, Joseph was sold to a man named Potiphar. Joseph worked for Potiphar, and Potiphar was very pleased with Joseph, for Joseph worked very hard for Potiphar and did whatever he was told. Then one day, someone told a lie about Je Joseph, a terrible lie, and Potiphar believed the lie over Joseph, his most trusted servant, and Joseph was sent to jail. While in jail, Joseph befriended the other prisoners and cared for them. God continued to smile on Joseph, even though he faced many hard times. The warden or leaders of the prison put Joseph in charge of the other prisoners because he saw how well the prisoners responded to Joseph. While in prison, with God's help, Joseph began to interpret dreams. One night, the Pharaoh of the land had a dream. His dream was about seven cows and stalks of grain. Pharaoh had heard of Joseph interpreting dreams, so he sent for him. Pharaoh asked Joseph to tell him what his dreams meant. Joseph told Pharaoh that his dreams were from God and that God would tell him through Joseph what they meant. He said that there would be seven years of abundant harvest and seven years of famine. He told Pharaoh that he needed to put back some of the harvest from each year of abundance. That way his people would be cared for when the famine came. Years later, Pharaoh's dreams came true. Pharaoh was so happy with Joseph that he put him in charge of all the food. 
Joseph's plan or God's plan for Joseph was for Joseph to help all the people. Hungry people came from all over to get food from Joseph. Famine stretched all the way to Joseph's hometown and his family. Joseph's brothers were starving. Joseph's brothers made the long journey to Egypt to get food. When they arrived to get food, they did not recognize Joseph. For many years had passed. Joseph had a choice to make. His brothers had not been kind to him. They had sold him and they had made his life very hard. But God always had a plan for Joseph, even when things were hard. Joseph not only gave his brothers food, but he revealed himself to them. Joseph's brothers were very sorry for what they had done and very grateful for Joseph for giving them and providing them with food after, even after all they had done to him. Even though things got hard for Joseph, Joseph continued to follow God's plan for his life. So when things get hard, remember this verse, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. And that's found in Jeremiah 29, 11. So whenever you things get tough, just remember, God has a plan for me. And that is all I have for you today. And I hope that everybody has a great week and we will see everyone later. Have a great week. Hi, I'm Kim McKinley and I'm going to be singing Gospel Changes.
So uh, today we're actually in Fairborn United Methodist Church. We're in uh, we're in their sanctuary. This is one of their stained glass windows, and we're looking at the back side of their sanctuary. Um, another uh, beautiful arrangement and another place for all of us uh, just to um, to worship together. Uh, so let's pray as as I uh, share with us today. Okay. May the words of my mouth and may the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Um, have you ever been cornered by someone asking you questions? I have. Um, many times they're, they're simplistic and innocent like, um, why is the sky blue? Or um, uh, why? Where, where are all the unicorns? Or is is Superman real? Or can God make a rock so heavy that even He can't lift it? I've I've, I've heard all of these, and then there are questions that people ask that they 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 already know the answer, but they want to know what you know. They want to try to sometimes see what little you know, or they want to know what strengths you may have. Um, you can you can try that with people on a quiz show or or around a friendly table, but I strongly suggest that one not try it with our Savior. Mind you, not that Jesus was vindictive, but he was one who knew how to properly answer questions in front of a person or crowds or a studio audience. And Jesus's purpose was always to invite more people to know him and build the kingdom and be promised eternal life. The disciples, they asked Jesus questions Who's the greatest among us? What good deed do we have to do to receive eternal life? And for every question someone else following Jesus asked, Peter would ask them, um, they would ask another, how often must I forgive? Now, if you were listening last week, you already heard that. Um, we left everything for you, Lord. What do we get? Yep. You know, they ask that. Sometimes we ask that. These these questions are are all reveal, revealing, with all with the exception of John and perhaps ironically, a Pilate. The questions are are all self serving. Those who ask Jesus questions want to trap him or impress him or. <laughs> they want to get something from him. And to every pointed question, Jesus offers an equally pointed answer, which reveals truth about the kingdom. And here in Matthew, Jesus responds to the question put to him with a question of his own. You know why? Because Jesus is good at that. The, um, the chief priests and elders asked Jesus where his authority comes from. They want to know, where are you getting all of this stuff that you do? And, and his return question from, from Jesus is about John the baptizer. He doesn't answer their question. Jesus asked them if John's baptism came from heaven or from the human mind. His question re reverses the trap which the chief priest and elders are trying to set for Jesus. And you know that Jesus' accusers, you know what they do? This is what they do when, when he asks that. They take the fifth, refusing to answer Jesus, lest it incriminate them in the eyes of all the crowds that are out there. And the crowds 
are watching absolutely everything. So Jesus, in turn, <laughs> he doesn't answer their question about his authority either. But you know what he does? You know what he does? Just like he always does. Jesus tells a parable. You see, it's an opportunity to have the crowds listen and they listen. And really, we, we should listen as well. The parable sets up a comparison of, of two sons. One who says he'll do what his father asked but, but doesn't. And with one who says he won't do anything, but he does. This story sounds very, very normal. It sounds like a real family. For everyone who hears this parable, the comparison, it, 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 it helps them. Well, it actually forces them to ask the question, um, which one am I? Am I the one who, who presents myself as obedient while running around raising havoc? Or am I the one who to all appearances is the, is the black sheep? But in the end, I do what's needed. Which one am I? But there's a more important question. Which one are you? There's an accusation in the parable. Some who claim to obey the Father and observe the requirements of the law, they fail in actuality to, to do so. Is this who we are as, believer, as believers? Which am I? There is also a reversal of expectations in the parable. Those who, who are seen as the opposite of the, of the good believers, some who have failed to live in the right way, will be given entry to the kingdom of heaven first. So which are you? Jesus returns after telling this this comparative parable to, to John the Baptist. He returns accusation for accusation. For John came to you in the way of righteousness. And you, and you didn't believe him. But you know what? The tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you didn't change your minds and believe him. That's what scripture says. The one whose voice cried out in the wilderness, who was sent to prepare the way of the Lord, preaching repentance, went unrecognized and unbelieved. They did not change their mind. Jesus tells us, but you know what? But the tax collectors and the prostitutes and other people who were wayward did. So, which am I? Which, which will you be? We may not be chief priests and elders of Jesus' day asking the Messiah accusing questions. Still, the parable may speak, it may speak volumes to us. Jesus' parable is, in the end, well, it's a challenge. It asks us how we will respond to the truth of the gospel. Will we change our mind and believe or not? Will we be the one who pretends obedience or the one who turns around and changes our mind? 
the cross allows us to make this all possible. You see, Jesus was never looking for perfect people. You hear that? Jesus was never looking for perfect people, only followers who want a relationship. That's it. So when, when the questions seem tough and, and people try to make you confused with this Jesus stuff, remember the one who, who challenged you to serve in a kingdom that may, may have strife but needs people who will love and be the hands and feet of Jesus. That's you. You have to do it. Be that disciple of Christ who is willing to listen and change and believe. Still, still, you will ask questions. I know you will. I still do at times. But always be open to hear more than your own thoughts. We still have a lot of questions. I think we will until our dying day when we go to be home with the Lord. But as you journey in the valleys, in the mountains, just remember that God's with you. And remember always that Jesus loves you and Jesus loves me. This I know and know as we go anywhere, Jesus will be with us through every question. May God continue to be with us on our journey of faith. Amen. Blessed Savior is 
John Wesley said these words. He said, do all you can. Do all the good you can. By all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. And the only way we can do this is with the grace of God through Jesus Christ. Go and be the hands and feet of Jesus this week. Have a good week wherever you are. Enjoy everything you can with the love and grace of Christ. Amen. Amen.